Dead Scared Entertainment takes pleasure in presenting Goverda Darano, a journey into the phantasmagoric lands of folklore, literature, theater, and film. In the centuries-old tradition of the Romane people, we bring to you stories of superstition, fantasy, and adventure. There's no turning back. La Verda approaches. Good evening, friend. I'm Esma Kalai. I'm so glad to have run into you amidst this hazy path. There is a story of a man I've been meaning to tell you. It happened not too long ago, either. Such a queer time of year we find ourselves in, no? That place between winter and spring. We're all looking for a fresh start, but the shadows of those long, frigid nights linger with their icy fingers that never reaching out. You can never tell what waits in the cold, cold dark. Never trust the shadows, Midwamal. Your eyes may play tricks on you, but your visitors are predators. Their game? Patience. Patiently waiting for the moment to attack their prey. Foolish, you think? I say not. He was a well-studied man, and even accounted for each moment before... Well, let me tell you. Overda Darano proudly presents the Bed of Shadows by Fred R. Farrow Jr. March 6th At last, after two months of sleeping on a cot, I am back in my own room again. It has been completely redecorated and refurnished. First of all, It now boasts a real fireplace, not one of those make-believe electric affairs, but one with andirons and a screen. How cozy it will be to read by its flickering light on long winter nights. The walls are paneled in driftwood oak, up to within two feet of the ceiling, which is papered in some odd design. The furniture, selected by my sister Myra, is of early colonial period. The bed especially is a prize. A huge, grim four-poster with dingy dark maroon drapes on the sides and open at the top. As I have a passion for reading in bed, Myra has provided a wrought iron bridge lamp which can be swung so as to illuminate my book. The room is so delightfully gloomy that I can hardly wait until evening to lie there in bed and begin reading Ghost House, which I picked up at the store today. As I had intended, I retired about 11 last night to read. I had my bridge lamp on and the curtains on that side of the bed were drawn back. The interior looked so dark except where the light shone through the parted curtains that it seemed almost like entering a tomb. There was a log fire which cast queer, quavering shadows on the ceiling. The ceiling. I had not noticed before what sort of paper Myra had picked out for the ceiling. It has a most intriguing design of scroll work on a dark background. I lay in my gloomy bed and idly traced out the intricate curves in the wavering firelight. My book is only fair. I read about two chapters and then put it down. My eyes wandered to the ceiling. I shall read some more tonight. There is a, a faint musty smell in the air. Perhaps the curtains need airing. I shall speak to Myra about it tomorrow. March 8th. It is wonderful to have a fireplace in one's room. It seems so completely comfortable when the fire is just barely flickering to watch the little flames leaping up from the charred logs. I read some more of Ghost House. (laughs) The book gets better as I progress. 
From time to time, I cast my gaze up at the ceiling. I don't know why, but somehow enjoy looking at the odd design of scrolls and spirals. A queer pastime, but fascinating. If Myra knew, she would wonder at it. I wonder myself. March 9th. As soon as I retired last night, my gaze rested on the ceiling. For the first time, I seemed to feel attracted in some vague, uncomfortable way by the queer spirals on the paper. What was it that I read long, long ago about certain Kabbalistic designs and their power to hypnotize one who looked at them too long? I seem to remember only the one called the swastika. <laughs> Surely none are on my paper. Again, I noticed the peculiar odor. Myra declares she airs the room every morning. Uh, just a word about my dreams. For the past two nights, I have dreamed about my room. In the dream room, there is something indefinably terrible. I cannot place what it is as of yet. I wake up with an uneasy feeling that all is not as it should be in my room. Perhaps I shall have the same dream again. Strange that I have had it now for two consecutive nights. March 10th, Sunday. Again, I have had the same dream. In some odd fashion in my dream, I seem to be in my gloomy old four poster, the curtains tightly closed looking up at the ceiling, which is fitfully illuminated by the dying fire. I know definitely that the disturbing influence, whatever it is, is in the ceiling. This morning when I awoke, I was exhausted. Perhaps I did not sleep at all, but lie there all night tracing out those maddening curves and spirals by the light of the fire. Terrible thought, that of not knowing whether one is actually dreaming or lying there in that dim, shadowy void between true slumber and wakefulness. I must go to bed early tonight. If my book becomes more exciting, I may be able to keep my eyes from those mocking spirals on the ceiling. I hope so. March 11th. A peculiar thing happened last night. As it was Sunday, I retired early to read. After an unsuccessful attempt to rivet my mind on my book, I put it down in disgust. Eagerly, why do I use the word? My eyes turned to the ceiling. For the first time, instead of tracing out the little scrolls and whirls, I saw the thing as a whole. It is strange and a little uncanny, for the vague blurred outline bears a semblance to some... some monster. If I look directly, I cannot see it. If, however, I look out of the corner of one eye, then it takes shape. I got out of bed to throw a log on the fire. Immediately the whole fantastic design seemed to fade away and became simply the paper ceiling. Seen from the bed again, the faint, irregular outline reappeared after a few moments. Perhaps I should get rid of the four-poster. It is so huge and even sinister with its old red drapes that it may be affecting me as I lie there, night after night, trying to read my book. Certainly there is a smell as of old cloth. Myra came in last night. Can't you sleep, Paul? she asked. No, dear. I have been reading and have read myself wide awake. Dear girl, she would never understand. She has no imagination. Show her a fragment of cloth from an airplane wing brought down in battle. She would see, simply, a piece of cloth. So many inches wide by so long. Po possibly a bit soiled. She would get no thrill of the thought, nor would she even think that the piece of cloth, miles above the earth, helping to sustain the plane, dodging and dipping around and finally coming down with terrible speed after a well-directed shot. Ah, uh, well, maybe she is better off without an imagination. Perhaps most truly happy people are so because they lack one. March 12th. This thing is becoming fascinating. As I undressed last night, I looked up at the ceiling. Ordinary, commonplace paper with a design. As soon as I got in bed, though, I looked up and saw the outline of the, shall I say, thing? 
It has only a vague shape and I cannot say just what it resembles. I tried the experiment of leaning out one side of the bed. Immediately the form disappeared. Can it be because of the poor lighting and the fact that I and my bed lie in comparative darkness? Or is it something evil and sinister that is taking place? I have had no more dreams. March 13th. Tonight, I gave up all pretense of reading. The form in the ceiling fascinates me. Its shape is becoming more and more clearly defined. I am anxious and yet I dread to see what it will resemble if it continues to grow in clearness. Myra suspects something. She questioned me several times as to why I look so worn and haggard after what she thinks is a good night's sleep. If she only knew, she would not wonder. But she must never know, or she will think I am mad. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps I am. I wonder. March 14th. My work at the office suffers because of the strange fascination of the ceiling. I cannot keep my mind off of it for a single moment. At night, as soon as I can leave Myra on a pretext of reading in bed, as though anyone could read inside of those old dark drapes, I slip into my dressing gown and lie there gazing at the ceiling. It is now more than just interest which draws my attention. It's like an, an awful attraction which compels us against our very will to look at some terrible accident or catastrophe when we would like to shut our eyes. The form is growing clearer. It resembles a gigantic bat. March 15th. I must get rid of my four-poster. It is exerting some evil influence over me i am sure still i have a morbid desire to see this thing through to the finish last night the details of the shape in the ceiling became more and more pronounced i imagined i saw its eyes in addition some of the scrolls and spirals seemed to actually writhe i could not have been asleep the bridge lamp was on i have a feeling that soon the purpose behind all of this will be terribly revealed to me. Somehow, I can detach my mind for a time and regard myself in this grim little drama from a distance. I see myself inside my darkened bed behind the red drapes, a look of terrible fascination in my eyes, looking, waiting, watching, for what? March 16th. I am writing this in my bed and will make notes of all that happens. As soon as I closed the drapes, I looked up at the ceiling. It was already there, a huge irregular murky blot on the paper with the writhing scrolls and spirals. The thing is gaining in clarity and definition. Now as I lie here and look up, its form is quite distinct. I am watching it. I can see its ripped wings and its little red eyes. Can I be sane? Evilly glowing. An odor of things long since consigned to the grave pervades the air. The smell of a charnel house. The fire is almost gone out. The wood ashes smolder and fall to the hearth. The thing in the ceiling seems to suddenly move. It's great. Bony wings flap slowly and clumsily. It is crawling. Crawling along the ceiling until it gets directly over my head. It's only a few feet away. Closer. Closer. And oh god, it's going to jump down! The young man was found dead in bed the following morning, an unforgettable look of terror in his wide, staring eyes. Death, the coroner reported, due to heart failure, evidently induced by some violent shock. 
but engraven in tiny characters in the ugly carved headboard of the grim old four-poster was found the curious legend. Let him that sleepeth in this bed take heed ere reason leave his head. I must admit, that diary of his was a real page-turner. But see, I told you, Amal, the shadows are not to be underestimated. The strangest thing of it all is the irony in his fate. A fresh start with the bed that holds a dark, cursed past. Even with the cozy fireplace and heavy velvet curtains to cocoon him safe and snug, Something sinister emanated from its bedeviled beams. Imagine trying to sleep with that thought lingering on you tonight. <sighs> it is a pity though to see such a bright young man, with a good taste in books might I add, go so soon. Part of me imagines that giant bat carrying off his soul to the far reaches of unmentionable dimensions. I wouldn't be surprised if they reminded him of the haunt in his own thrilling volumes. But, just like the death of winter and the rebirth of spring, we must move on. Move on to new thrills, new horrors, new tales. So, as I always say, Midwamal, Gia kor mangak tuke bachtalotrom prekotunya ripe. Till then, I wish you safe travels through the darkness. This broadcast of Averda Darano was brought to you by the talents of Pearson Raquel Horvath, creators of Dead Scared Entertainment, with the help of Pirosh Karach. You've been listening to a production from Dead Scared Entertainment, where terror is our tradition. Good night.